And hello, everyone. Hopefully, everyone can see and hear me. And we are live streaming to Facebook and we are recording. So we are go. Uh, my name is Brendan Stone. I'm the co chair of the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War and co host of the Unusual Sources Radio program, along with Doug Brown. And we just started up again for the season. So I want to thank everyone for coming to our special panel today. And it's called why Canada should release Meng Wanzhou now. And the panel is organized by the Cross Canada Campaign to Free Meng Wanzhou. Um, so I, everyone is just streaming in right now, and I'm glad you're able to come. We have uh, up to 150 people registered at the moment, and uh, we'll, we've just been giving a few seconds for everyone to join us. But um, a question has been posed to me by organizers, and that is, about the election. We just had an election here in Canada. So what does that mean? Because new governments have new agendas. And we notice that even returning governments in the case of the liberal re-election, in the case of Trudeau's re-election, we note that even returning governments often change direction on certain files. And for us, that's meaningful because it means that there could be a direction a change in direction on the case of Meng Wanzhou. So now would be a very good time for Justin Trudeau to acknowledge his mistake, apologize to China, and reestablish good relations with the People's Republic of China. So with that in mind, I'd like to go ahead with today's panel. And I've been asked to read out the sponsoring organizations that have endorsed the event. And so we have the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War, the Canadian Peace Congress, World Beyond War Canada, the Canada-China Council for Cooperation and Development, the Canadian Foreign Policy Institute, Just Peace Advocates, New Cold War, No Cold War, Mobilization Against War and Occupation, Friends of Socialist China, the International Action Center, USA, and Popular Resistance, USA. Maybe it would have been better to list all the organizations that didn't sponsor the event. That might have been a shorter list. <laughs> um, but in any case, our official media sponsor is the Canada Files. And you may be hearing from them later. Uh, we are going to have a question period. Um, there is a note about fundraising. And that is, we have a lot of expenses. So we're hoping you could contribute to our coffers here. Um, if you go to the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War website, hcsw.ca, um, we have some electronic logistics to deal with. Uh, we have to upgrade our MailChimp account. We're at 2,500 subscribers, but there's more people that want to get on there. We have to go to a higher tier. Um, if you know of any cheaper plans, let us know. Uh, we want to renew our Zoom account for the year. Um, we got to afford the webinars too at some point. We'd love to do that, uh, maybe for the international panel. Um, and we have to do some building on the website. We have to especially uh, put up the, uh, the section on the Meng Wanzhou campaign. There's been so many developments, so many things we've done, so many articles, op-ed pieces, all these things. We need to um, put that all together where people can see it. And we have to hire graphic artists, poster artists. Uh, all those Hmong graphics don't come out of nowhere. Those nice banner images with the big red Hmong Wanzhou and all of that, that, <laughs> that requires artists. And we have some YouTube services. So um, that and some equipment. If you can help us out on any of that, please go to hcsw.ca and, and to the donate section. I'll mention that again at the end. But um, we do have just a couple of rules of engagement for today. Uh, we have three very knowledgeable panelists with us. We're very grateful to have each and every one of them. They're going to be speaking shortly for 10 minutes each. And uh, it won't be long after that, that the chat will be opened up, the chat here in Zoom, for you to pose questions to our panelists. And uh, we simply ask that the questioners be respectful uh, to the panelists to address their question in a respectful or at least not disrespectful manner. If they're not respectful questions, we're simply not going to read them. Um, so uh, with that in mind, let's go over to our panelists. Um, and uh, there's a lot to say about all of them. We're, we're gonna, I'm gonna introduce the first panelist and he's going to speak and then you'll hear more about the other panelists. But the first panelist I'd like to introduce tonight is John Philpott. Um, oh, and it's 
it's I've been requested to enable live transcription. Uh, here we go. Can everybody there? I see it. We have live transcription for those who require it. Um, so the first panelist I'd like to introduce is John Philpot. Um, he's an avid cyclist. Uh, at least that's what he he told. Well, he came back from cycling in the pre meeting. He had said he had just come back from some uh, exercise. But um, what John is someone I've known my entire life. He's been doing political work to expose imperialism generally. Uh, such as United States in Africa, but also Canada's role in propagating this system, Canada's relationship with the United States, uh, the relationship with other powers, with France. He is very much involved in all of the relevant bodies and activities to analyze the question before us now concerning Meng Wanzhou. So according to his biography, uh, John Philpot is a Canadian criminal defense attorney and expert in international criminal law. He has 35, exper 35 years experience as a lawyer, activist, and speaker in the international peace movement in Canada, Latin America, Africa, the Middle East, and Asia, and uh, a member of the coordinating committee of the coalition BDS in Quebec. He recently joined the board of Just Peace Advocates. John is president of the Rwandan Political Prisoner Support Network, a former judge at the Kuala Lumpur War Crimes Tribunal. And in 2019, John was an observer for International Trial Watch, Catalan referendum case in Madrid. So I'm very pleased to present to you now, John Philpot. Let's go over to John. Well, I'd like to congratulate the Hamilton Coalition for this event. And I also really liked hearing the names of all the organizations by ear and not by a list. So thank you. I'm going to put on my prosecutor's hat to explain what this is all about. This man, this woman, Meng Wanzhou, tried to defraud HSBC, a, a bank based in Hong Kong, because she misrepresented the relationship of one of their subsidiaries, Skycom, and its relationship with uh, Iran. And in doing so, this, this uh, HSBC was put at risk in losing money because they were, they were going to violate US sanctions adopted by the United States government. And therefore, she committed fraud by putting this company at risk. And she should be, and this transaction went, has, is covered by United States law because the transaction went through a US bank for a, million, a millionth of a second. So the US has a jurisdiction to charge Meng Wanzhou and they have the right to put, get their hands on her by all legal means by extradition. That's the prosecutor's case, more or less. I hate, uh, so you all hate me now, I hope. Now, um, I want to, this is all understandable. Extradition is very simple in principle. I am charged with murder in Florida. My name is John Philpot. I'm in Canada. And they have five witnesses or something saying I killed uh, one of my neighbors. And then they make a summary of the evidence. They go and see the Canadian government. And the Canadian government looks at it and says, oh, it sounds reasonable. Um, and they put a, uh, they arrest me and apply to have me surrendered to US justice. And the principle is between countries is, is not unreasonable. I mean, there's a lot of flaws. I'm not going to get into the flaws now. But if I have an alibi, I have 50 witnesses in London saying John Philbot was in London that day. I can't bring that into evidence in the trial. And this is one of the things that it's hard, important to understand for Meng Wanzhou is that all her evidence, all her defenses can't really be brought in trial, in her extradition trial. They just have to look and see whether the crime of fraud, the fraud in the US and the fraud in Canada are similar. Now, that's more or less what it is. Um, the situation, of course, is much more complex and it's very shocking. Uh, just a small example, which makes me shiver. Uh, when you go through transit in Canada or in the US, you don't go through customs often. You, 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 just, you just wave through and sent to another plane, but they sent her through customs. 
and they had her detained temporarily, of course, to go through customs. And she had no right to a lawyer because a lawyer, you don't, you don't have a right to a lawyer when you're in immigration. So they asked her for her um, passwords for her devices, I think it was a phone or computer or tablet. And she gave them and that was all sent to the, F, was obtained for the FBI. And the man in charge named Ben Chang is no longer in Canada. He's in uh, China or in um, near, near Hong Kong doing, working with a casino. Now these are, this is the situation right now. She has been charged with some an offense because it went through the US computers. Now, why is this wrong? And um, Julie Tang is going to talk about the double criminality issue. I won't, I won't get into that one today. But the US law applying to third parties is totally illegal because the US cannot intervene in the internal affairs of another country under the United Nations Charter adopted in 1946. So any laws it has with respect to third parties like China have no legal value. A second aspect of this, and we'll get into it in the question period, Mr. Trump said, well, we're going to arrest her and we'll try and use her for our negotiations uh, with China on economic issues. It's a political offense and extradition when states were developed 150 years ago, extradition was ex political trials for political refugees was excluded. Um, now, where are we at now? This has been going on for uh, more than a thousand days. It's what, it was 1,040 days, 20 days, I'm not sure. Um, what's the situation? Well, uh, the Hong Kong court recently showed by documents HSBC applied to a court and they have all the evidence that the HSBC knew exactly what it was getting into. They're a very senior bank. Actually, they've been caught for money laundering, but they know what they're getting into. And they met Meng Wanzhou, the senior executives met her, and they knew what was going on, going on, and they knew the risks. So they weren't being put at risk. This is not in evidence because it was obtained it's kind of a defense. So it wasn't allowed into evidence. Maybe it should have been, maybe it shouldn't have been. I won't pronounce on it. I wasn't in court for that, but it's understandable, understandable it not be in court. But the judge, what did she say? What's important is the Canadian government knows there was no fraud, no attempt at fraud, no danger. And at a recent hearing, Judge Holmes said, well, I'm kind of curious um, because everyone knew there was no risk. There is no fraud. There's no danger of fraud. No one lost any, lost any money. Now, where does that put Meng Wanzhou detained for 1,020 days? She has children. She has a family. She has a life to live. She's living in Vancouver, paying for her own security, wearing an ankle, ankle uh, bracelet uh, 24 hours a day. Uh, the responsibility, and I'm talking about extradition law, Canada could have stopped it at the beginning, like many other countries refused to do this, Belgium, Mexico, and et cetera. They can stop it now. They have all the, they have more information than they had. If they had some good faith at the beginning, I don't believe there was, but if they had it, now they know, everybody knows that it's a fake because there was no risk and the HSBC was totally apprised of any risks of doing business and they can do it after. So this is the duty of Canada to stop this now with the new government. We have to talk, maybe there's a different minister of justice, I don't know. And let's just think if this happened to Sundar Pichar of Google or Bill Gates in another country like Australia, uh, Indonesia, on, based on a Chinese warrant, this would be a, ca a, a cause for war, I think. Um, and so let's just think the disrespect for a Chinese woman 
is something which should shock all our all our consciences. And I think if there's an element of racism saying, well, it doesn't really matter because she's Chinese. I, I don't know about that, but that's how I feel. It's I'm, I'm astounded by this. And um, we'd be most uh, interested in uh, and to answer your questions, we be it technical or political. I'm sure my, I myself and the other panelists would be most pleased to discuss with you. And I, I think I'm probably in my 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Brendan. Wow, and thank you, uh, John, for sticking within your time and uh, for these very specific examples that you've given us about the court case and the comparisons to help us understand this better. Uh, I think it really, really transitions well into our next speaker, actually, uh, which, of course, is Julie Tang. Um, and uh, uh, for those in, in the audience, this is the first time Julie has appeared on one of our panels about Meng Wanzhou. Uh, we were, in fact, very excited to learn about Julie's engagement with this issue. Uh, and I, I recall now she was giving an interview on the Anti-Empire Project along with KJ No, and we caught that. And from there, we, we knew she had to be in the event and we, we contacted Julie. Uh, she's, of course, a co-founder of Pivot to Peace, which is a very important organization we've worked together with before. Uh, she has quite a portfolio coming into this. Let me read out some of it to you. Uh, retired Judge Julie Tang was born and raised in Hong Kong and emigrated to the United States in 1967. She received a Bachelor of Arts degree at the University of San Francisco, her MA at the Stanford University, and JD degree at the University of California. She served on the San Francisco Community College Board from 1981 to 1990. She's a former San Francisco Assistant District Attorney from 1983 to 1990. In 1991, she was elected to serve as a San Francisco trial court judge, and she retired from the bench in 2014. But uh, that's not the end of it, because upon retirement, Judge Tang co-founded not one, but two peace organizations, the first being the Comfort Woman Justice Coalition in 2015. And that built a memorial to the Comfort Woman. And the second organization is of course, Pivot to Peace in 2020, very timely and relevant group that promotes peace and cooperation between the United States and China. So let's all welcome our distinguished guest and let's move over to Julie Tang. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brandon. It is such a pleasure and honor to be sitting here with uh, the two distinguished guests and to join up in a movement to help free Meng Wanzhou. The Meng Wanzhou's case is now approaching the finish line. Sometime in October, Justice Holmes will be expected to decide whether the Canadian government has provided credible evidence in support of each element of the case to establish a prima facie showing that Meng Wanzhou should be extradited. Based on her previous rulings on the two major issues in controversy, that is the double criminality issue and the exclusion of rebuttal evidence from the defense, I don't think you will find many surprises in her final decision. On the other hand, there is ample legal authority for her to dismiss the case outright. First of all, a judge has a wide discretion to weigh the evidence before her. She will be reversed only if it is shown that she abused the discretion. That means doing something that is so clearly wrong and inexplainable. But when it comes to the law, she is duty bound to follow it. The ethical duties of a judge compel her to make decisions regardless of political pressure or public opinion. I hope she will be courageous and honor the fundamental responsibility of a judge to keep politics aside and follow the law. If she does that, it will be one big step towards justice and peace. Now, in order to meet the prima facie standards, which is where we are now at the stage of the proceeding, and the prima facie standards for extradition uh, are very simple. The prosecution must prove one, that Meng Wanzhou told a lie. Second, the lie harmed HSBC. The harm is what John referred to earlier in his talk. The harm must be real and tangible. The harm must be a property or money harm that had been suffered by the victim, a harm that you can put a price tag on. It cannot be a speculative or some sort of risk of harm that could not be identified. 
harm is a material issue that will be pertinent to the final decision on extradition. Just a week ago, a US federal judge in the state of Tennessee dismissed fraud charges, including wire fraud charges, the same charges that Meng Wanzhou is facing against a Chinese American professor in the state of Tennessee. The name of the case is US United States of America versus An Ming Hu. I think we're gonna put the citation um, in the chat later. Now, Dr. Hu is a Chinese American professor who was charged with hiding information about his association with the Chinese university on his application for a federal grant from NASA. The case went to trial. The jury could not decide whether he committed fraud. The judge, upon a motion by the defense, dismissed the case outright. The court ruling is very instructive for the Man Wang Zhao case because they talk about actual tangible harm is critical and necessary to the victim in the form of loss and property or money in order for fraud to be established. Again, speculative or risk of harm would not do. In Dr. Hu's case, the prosecution could not establish that NASA, the federal grant agency, suffered any harm. And even though NASA would not have given Professor Hu a grant, had it known Professor Hu had done some work with a Chinese university, which he allegedly did not disclose, the fact that NASA was satisfied with Professor Hu's work showed that Professor Hu and NASA each got the benefit of the bargain. Therefore, given that no harm was suffered by NASA, there was no fraud, case dismissed. In Ma Wan Zhao's case, Crown Counsel did not present evidence that HSBC suffered any harm. And the judge gave Crown Counsel a big break in finding double criminality without clearly defining whether tangible harm was suffered by HSBC, an element of fraud. But at this critical juncture, Judge Holmes could no longer ignore harm is an important element in her determination whether a prima facie case has been proven by Crown Counsel. The facts are, Huawei got the loan, paid the fee and interest to HSBC pursuant to the deal that they made. Each got the benefit of the bargain. During final argument, Justice Holmes show that she is actually on notice that no harm has happened to HSBC in the last four years since Huawei and HSBC entered into business relationship. In the case of US versus An Ming Hu, that case cited multiple legal precedents for supporting the argument that actual tangible harm, not risk of harm or speculative harm must exist to support a fraud finding. And Justice Holmes herself stated in her written opinion on the double criminality issue, she has no difficulty taking into account US laws that explain what amounts to fraud. For that purpose, of the, for the purpose of the prima facie determination, I hope that she would take judicial notice of the case of United States versus An Ming Hu, because the case and also the case that was cited in that decision and follow the precedent. I recognize this is not a trial, but a prima facie evidence uh, hearing, but a decision supporting a prima facie case must have integrity and follow the law. And a prima facie case requires that each element of the charge must be considered and decided. Falling short of that, it is a legal error. In a criminal case, a judge has the added responsibility to protect a defendant's constitutional rights a duty not required in civil law. That means a judge must sua sponte on her own, raise issues of the law and facts to protect and guarantee the constitutional rights of a person accused of a crime. A judge does not have the same duty in, in civil cases because civil matters do not involve life and liberty, the highest personal rights one has under the constitution. Justice Holmes raised a lot of good questions at the final arguments which points out she understood her basic judicial obligation. Among the questions that she asked, does the business relationship between Skycom, which is the organization Huawei is associated with, and Iran uh, with Iran involving uh, good business or business? The question was that, does the business that Huawei had with Iran involved good business or bad business? Evidently, the U.S. sanction against Iran has exemptions. It does not sanction good business engaged with Iran, only the bad businesses. So what 
is good business and what is bad, bad business? Well, that question, Justice Holmes asked Crown Counsel. Crown Counsel did not have the answer, but told the judge he would have the answer after lunch break. So when he came back from the lunch break, probably having spoken to his supervisor, he punted the question back to the judge by asking the judge to make a reasonable inference that Huawei was involved with bad businesses. This is not acceptable practice. If the record of the case does not clearly state the pertinent facts that support the accusations, they don't have a case, not even a prima facie case. The Ma Manjiao case has been made very complicated with all the legal minutia being contested by people who practice law for a living. But it's really not that difficult a case. Take away the casings and sheaves of legal jargon. It is a case of kidnapping for ransom, masquerading as a criminal matter with high stakeholders. It is an exploitation of legal loopholes, manipulation of financial controls, and the force of power that allows one country to subdue another to do its bidding. Under Trump, the arrest of Mao Wanjiao was a scheme to force China to give the US a better trade deal. The question that I have is, what about Biden? He inherited this case from Trump. What is he doing with it? Is this something like what the French foreign minister said at the UN meeting two days ago in regard to the US behavior and conduct in the Indo-Pacific war? The French minister said that it is part of an essential aspect of the US systematic confrontation of China in preparation for a final blowout in the imminent prospect of a global US war with China. The world need peace, not war. And if the evidence is not there to extradite men, she should be released back to her family, her young children and her country. It is the right thing to do. It is the courageous thing to do. Canada and its citizens are carrying a lot of garbage on their shoulders. As Henry Giesinger said, it may be dangerous to be America's enemy, but to be America's friend is fatal. Let's keep our fingers crossed for Mang Wan Zhao, whose only crime is she is the daughter of a brilliant man who founded a great technological firm called Huawei. And most importantly, let's hope the judge will do the right thing, make a courageous decision without political considerations. I think I'm also over my 10 minutes, but I hope I'll have an opportunity to cover the issues that I try to share later on during questions and answers. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Judge Tang. Uh, thank you for several reasons. In fact, uh, thanks for going into the specifics of these dubious accusations against Hmong so you could, we could see how that works. And similarly, of course, simplifying the issue for us. Um, you know, what's it really about, especially the large political questions that are behind this case? It's a matter of power politics, and it ultimately relates to question of war and peace that we all need to be aware of, whatever our level of awareness of legal matters is, this is about a very big issue that affects everyone. Um, and just like John's talk led nicely into yours, in fact, what you're saying leads nicely into our next speaker, who has a lot to say about what this means to Canadians um, and other geopolitical ramifications. I'm, of course, speaking about Stephen Gowans. He's our final panelist to speak in the panel section. And he is the Ottawa-based author of the political analysis blog, What's Left. <laughs> what an appropriate title that is. Uh, you know, in the last few decades, uh, it's been a time when so many people have walked away from the struggle, the struggle for economic justice, the struggle for respectful relationships at the international level. Um, but Stephen did not walk away. He was compelled to ask himself and others, what's left? in terms of that struggle. And for a long time, it did not seem as if there was much left. But in my view, we're seeing new developments now, a new anti-imperialist movement emerging around the world. And Stephen has always been there as a cardinal point on the compass to guide us. I'd call him a guiding light, you know, a star in the sky or something like that, but that's not his style. He's very much on the earth, in the thick of it, engaged with the substance of what's happening. Um, some of his fans have called him a radical rationalist, and I have to agree. And, uh, you know, when he's not writing articles, he's writing popular books that have been translated into multiple languages. Uh, these include Washington's Long War on Syria, uh, Patriots, Traitors, and Empires, the story of Korea's fight for freedom, and Israel, 
a beachhead in the Middle East. And this is listed on the poster, actually. So if you go look at that, you can find the book titles. And of course, you can find his blog, What's Left, at gowans.blog. That's G-O-W-A-N-S dot blog. And I know he wants to tell us all about why the arrest of Meng Wanzhou should matter to Canadians and a lot of the other related issues. So without further ado, let's go over to Stephen Gowans. Thank you, Brendan. Well, the Prime Minister insists that Canada's role in the arrest and detention of Meng Wanzhou at the behest of the United States, not at the request of the behest, is unaffected in any way by the overt US campaign to undermine China, is unrelated in any way to the determination of the United States to respond vigorously to the challenge China poses to US economic supremacy, is unaffected in any way by ongoing US efforts to undermine and destroy Huawei, is unrelated in any way to US efforts to deter challenges to its illegal economic coercive measures, which we know informally as sanctions, and is unaffected in any way by the acknowledged intention of the previous US administration to use Meng as a bargaining chip in its trade negotiations with China. Instead, the prime minister insists against all evidence, against all reason, with patent insincerity, that Canada's arrest and detention of Meng is simply the blind pursuit of justice and a principled adherence to the rule of law. Well, that claim is groundless. I mean, the reality is that we have knuckled under to a US demand to act as an accomplice to a political kidnapping, a political kidnapping that is part of a larger war waged by the United States to maintain its economic supremacy in the face of a challenge from China. And when Donald Trump said he would call off US efforts to extradite Meng in return for trade concessions, he effectively admitted that the arrest and detention of the Huawei CFO was a political kidnapping and indirectly indicted Canada as his accomplice. Now, the ultimate goal of the kidnapping was and continues to be to promote the interests of US businesses. There's no benefit for Canadians. On the contrary, we've been hurt. And we will continue to be hurt unless we put our house in order. I mean, the aim of the kidnapping is twofold. First, as I've said, and as Trump acknowledged, to use Meng as a bargaining chip in Washington's commercial and trade war with China. Second, to deter challenges to the United States illegal coercive measures on other countries such as Iran by making an example of Hmong. It's a way of sending a message to foreign corporations when they're operating outside the United States. Do as we say, accept US law as applicable to all jurisdictions in which you operate. Submit to a de facto US global dictatorship or your executives may pay a hefty price. Well, Ming's kidnapping is also part of a larger campaign to, to weaken, to undermine, and ultimately to destroy Huawei, the jewel in China's high-tech crown. And the effort to destroy Huawei fits within a still broader US program of beating back challenges to the US domination of high value industries such as 5G, the emerging industry that Huawei dominated. And dominated to the point that Washington worried that the unbeatable combination of superior Huawei quality and the tract of Huawei pricing would allow the Chinese company to eliminate its competitors. So why should that worry Washington? Well, it worried Washington because US global espionage, it's spying on everyone, including its allies, among them German Chancellor Angela Merkel, that this depends on access to the world's telecom networks. We're told Huawei network equipment might be used by Beijing to spy on Western countries, and therefore Western telecom providers must not use Huawei equipment in their networks. But the real threat 
for the US intelligence community is not that Beijing might use Huawei to spy on the West, but that Huawei would deny Western intelligence agencies access to its network equipment, preventing the US from spying on the world. And with Huawei as the dominant 5G network equipment provider, that became a problem. I mean, the only way US intelligence can maintain its surveillance of global telecom networks is if 5G networks are dominated by network equipment providers that are willing to cooperate with US intelligence. And that's one of the reasons to destroy Huawei and to promote its competitors. Well, there's another purpose to the kidnapping, and that is to contribute to the ongoing campaign to demonize China in order to manufacture consent for anti-China aggression. As you know, a number of accusations have been hurled at China accusations without foundation. China is said to be conducting a genocide against the Uyghurs. The source of the accusation is completely unreliable. The evidence, totally non-existent. The COVID pandemic is said to have originated in a Wuhan lab leak, again, the claim made without evidence. China's island of Taiwan is presented in Western political discourse as an independent country on which Beijing has aggressive designs. Huawei is demonized as a national security threat. Well, if you accuse a high level executive of a major Chinese firm of engaging in bank fraud, well, this fits within the larger campaign of poisoning public opinion against China. And China is being portrayed in multiple ways as a malign actor, as the kind of country the West must vigorously oppose, militarily, you know, economically, diplomatically. And it's all part of a program of shaping public opinion to justify aggression against China. Well, returning to, to Meng, in demanding that we kidnap the Huawei CFO, Washington has demanded that we make a choice, that we choose between the United States and China. Well, Canadians don't want to be coerced into choosing one side or the other, nor do we want to play the role of self-sacrificing errand boy for US billionaires. I mean, we want a principle foreign policy, one that recognizes the sovereign equality of nations, one that upholds international law, one that rejects economic and military coercion, and one that exists to serve the interests of Canadians, not the interests of US billionaires, and not the interests of US foreign policy, and not the interests of US trade negotiators. I mean, Canada should recognize each country as the means to its own ends and not the means to someone else's ends, not the means to our ends, not the means to US ends. China's not the means to Washington's and Wall Street's ends. It's not the means to corporate America's ends and nor is Canada. So the first step on the road to a principled Canadian foreign policy I mean, to one that's responsive to the needs of Canadians, one that doesn't sacrifice our needs to those of US billionaires. The first step on that road is to free Mao. Well, why? Well, the first reason is to correct a misdeed. We shouldn't be accomplices in the kidnapping of foreign nationals. A misdeed all the worse for being undertaken so that billionaires in one country the United States can grow richer at the expense of their rivals in another. Second, Meng must be freed to begin the process of doing what's right for Canada, not what's good for you as billionaires. And what's right for Canada is to remove barriers to a mutually beneficial relationship between Canada and China, a relationship in which both countries benefit. And that relationship cannot prosper so long as we do nothing to reverse this act of aggression by Canada against China that was the kidnapping of a Chinese national for the purpose of allowing the United States to acquire a bargaining chip 
in its trade negotiations with Beijing and allowing Washington to advance its efforts to undermine China's development and in furthering Washington's efforts to vilify an economic competitor for the purpose of manufacturing consent for an escalating military confrontation with China. Well, finally, the call to free Meng isn't a call to do what is politically or legally impossible. On the contrary, it's within the authority of the federal government to end her detention. Our minister of justice has the power to release Meng immediately. And he ought to do so. He ought to do so in the interests of amnesty, in the interests of asserting an independent and principled Canadian foreign policy, in the interests of doing what's just. I mean, the United States is waging an economic war on China so that their billionaires can come out on top. And there's nothing controversial in this statement. Washington is quite open about what it's up to. But this isn't a war we want to be in the middle of. It's not our war, and it's not a war worth fighting. I mean, the only war worth fighting is a war to end oppression. And this isn't a war to end oppression. It's a war to resurrect the oppression to which China had long been subjected. So freeing Meng is the route out of the middle of the war and onto the path of a principled, independent Canadian foreign policy. A foreign policy in which Canadians are not puppets of US trade negotiators in which we're not puppets of US presidents, in which we're not puppets of US billionaires, but we're ends in ourselves, able to act on our own behalf, ends in ourselves, able to act on our own interests, determined to assert what's right for Canada and for Canadians. Back to you, Brendan. Well, thank you very much, Stephen. Yes, people want to clap, I see people clapping and that's that's wonderful thank you everyone uh yes Stephen, thanks for putting things into perspective as only you can um and for putting them in the perspective of the general anti-war organizing that makes up uh the, the people behind this event um you know it reminds me of a, a commentary that came out on the taylor report months ago in reference to the Hmong case which the title of it was uh uh free Hmong Wanzhou exit US hegemony. And th those two things are interlinked. In order for Canada to have an independent foreign policy, which seems so far away, I know, but we need to be able to make decisions that are not suicidal, that are imposed on us from Washington. And I'm, I'm sure people are going to have questions about that. They're going to have questions about what the other two panelists have said. Uh, there have been linkages drawn between the Hmong case and other relevant issues. And so um, what's going to happen now is uh, I think Allison is going to open up the chat, uh, which will enable people to pose questions in the chat window. And um, we there prior to that, we do have uh, a couple of people who are going to be able to ask questions first, uh, in, in particular, the sponsor for this event is the Canada Files. Um, and of course, this is a great publication that's been part of a number of our events and has been writing about the Mong Wanjo case. And it's my understanding that the editor in chief, Aidan Jonah, is present with us today. And uh, so he is here to, to ask a question or, or to uh, you know, link this issue as well to other issues. Um, so I think we may have them in, in the video. Uh, is it possible to transition us over to Aiden? Hello, all. Thanks so much uh, to the organizing team and everyone involved in this for the opportunity to be speaking. Uh, I am Aiden Jonah, editor in chief of The Canada Files. The Canada Files is a socialist anti imperialist investigative news outlet doing the work since November 2019 uh, covering Canadian foreign policy. So, of course, the first thanks really has to go out yet again to the organizers and also to the terrific speakers, John Philpott, Stephen Goins, and Julie Tang. All of you did terrific, and I'm really glad you hit on the points about how this really this case against Hmong is a true farce and the need for a truly sovereign Canadian foreign policy. I want to expand just on one thing, and this has been an element that's, I think, been dogging things for a while, 
<coughs> is the ugly topic of Michael Kovert and Michael Spavor. For the longest time, that's been something that a lot of people have left to the side. But the Canada Files, we stuck our necks out and we did the research and we showed those two Michaels, they committed espionage activities in China, in fact, and provided a very strong justification for their arrests on national security grounds. And the point I want to make, and the point that the organizers and the speakers have had to been dealing with this farcical argument, is attempting to tie the fates of the two Michaels and Meng Wanzhou. In fact, the only one that is blameless in this scenario is Meng Wanzhou. Meng Wanzhou should be free, irrespective of the, of the fate of the two Michaels. And so the article now I'm referring to is linked in below in the address. I thank all of you for the opportunity to hit on some important points. And yet again, I thank everyone involved in this for doing the terrific work you do. Journalism can have much impact, but without militant, fierce organizing, we wouldn't get it anywhere at all. Thank you so much. And thank you, Aiden. And people can find that uh, publication online. Look up the Canada files in your search engine. And while I'm on that subject, I believe um, earlier in the meeting, um, information that Julie Tang referred to was posted in the chat. Julie was referring to a court case uh, and uh, a PDF document was linked. So that may be visible in the chat, which should be opening up around this time. Uh, questions will be forwarded to me shortly. Um, one of the first that I received um, was, of course, from Michael Welch. Um, and uh, he has been uh, involved in various alternative media in Canada and uh, was able to contact us prior to the event. So he had a question for the panel, um, and uh, I'm going to leave it open as to who wants to jump in first on this. But uh, Michael's question is, there are indications that the arrest and extradition of Meng Wanzhou in December of 2018 was not indicated by the suspicion of violating Iran sanctions at the suspicion of the US, given that numerous other violations by non-Chinese companies were merely fined. So other uh, non-Chinese companies were only fined. Uh, so it seems like her arrest is linked to her being a Huawei chief financial officer. Uh, this incident took place six months after a meeting of the spy chiefs of the so-called Five Eyes countries to use intelligence sharing, uh, intelligence sharing Alliance to combat sabotage, namely the threat they said Huawei and its wireless system posed. So the question then is, has any uh, more been discovered in recent months that could certify that Meng Wanzhou has been tormented due to her role as Huawei chief financial officer and what was has made her a target. Well, <laughs> I'll try to address that question unless John or Stephen want to answer it. I think Mr. Welsh actually um, in asking a question basically answered it himself that there is selective prosecution here. And unfortunately this issue cannot be brought up during the prima facie evidentiary proceedings. But as a matter, if the case does go to trial, I'm sure this will be one of the pretrial motions that will be brought up. Yes, she was treated very selectively in, in, in in fact, I think she's the first case of a firm that is alleged to be in violation of the sanctions that is charged and in which the CEO herself is charged with a criminal case, put in jail uh, with a big but a hefty bail set on her with ankle monitors uh, wherever she goes. Uh, this, this kind of treatment is just unusual. And it's unusual because she is Chinese and because she is emblematic of the US-China war that is going on right now. So the humiliation, the degradation, and the dehumanization of Wang Wanzhou is necessary to dress China down, to contain China, and let China know that we will take care of you through taking care of Huawei. It is very sad, very painful 
for me as a Chinese American woman to see how Ma Wenzhou is what she's going through. I am I can't even imagine, but she is so strong and so resilient. Actually, I want to bring up a little history of, of China right now. In 2,500 years ago, we had the first emperor of China, the Qin Shi Huang. He's the one who built a great wall. And a lot of people said Mao Zedong is the second emperor of China because both individuals unified China and they both did something that unified China. Qin Shi Huang back in the 2500s built a great wall and unified the writing. So all Chinese write the same, no matter what language, what dialect you speak, we all have the same writing. Mao Zedong unified the verbal language, making Putonghua as the uniform language throughout China. What, but Qin Shi Huang was a hostage himself. Back in those days, there were a lot of, before Qin Shi Huang unified China, there were a lot of little tribes everywhere and they were fighting. But Qin Shi Huang, and at that time, they were trading hostages. So you would take my son, the prince, as a hostage. I will give you my second prince. And there's a lot of bothering going on. I just want to tell you that Chinese people are very resilient. They understand the, how bad it could be in looking back at history, in addition to the 100, the, whole, the century of, of humiliation. So I think China can weather it, but it doesn't mean that they have to take it. And just, I just hope that eventually something will be resolved and that Man Wan Zhao can go home and be freed of this hostage um, experience that she's having right now. But yes, it is selective prosecution, no doubt. And I think that that would be, that should, that would be litigated, I'm sure. Well, thank you for that extremely rich background on the hostage taking aspect of this in particular. That's something that has struck all of us uh, to this day. Um, I just want to make a couple of points about the question period. I see, I'm told people are began submitting questions immediately, so that's great. Um, and yes, as people have been doing, you can direct those questions to a particular panelist, if you like. Um, right now, it seems to be a, um, a little Judge Tang-centric at the mm -hmm. moment. There, there have been uh, several questions directed at uh, Judge Tang. And while we wait for questions directed at the other panelists, I'm going to take uh, one of those questions uh, for Judge Tang right now. Uh, and that is, uh, and this is, of course, directed at Judge Tang from Sheila Zhao. And it is, can Judge Tang tell us in her judicial experience whether Meng Wanzhou was treated fairly by the judge? Meng Wanzhou was treated very poorly. The Canadian court was making bail decisions, treating Meng Wanzhou as an extremely high flight risk criminal. Orders issued by the court to make sure that she doesn't take flight or jump bail do not comport with the crimes charged. The crime charge was fraud against a bank. Fraud could be a civil or criminal charge, also misdemeanor or felony, depending on prosecutorial discretion. The court made her pay for three full-time security guards who monitor activities 24 seven. Her bail man was exorbitant, $10 million. That amount is equivalent to someone accused of committing 10 murders. That in the United States court, one million bail is customary for someone accused of murder. And if the judge sees fit, usually it's actually no bail when it's murder. But we, if the judge does see fit, the judge would, would start with the $1 million or go up or a little down, depending on the circumstances. Now, I'm sure the money she has paid up to this point, security guard, the ankle monitor, the fees, and probably paid for all the security measures um, that exceeded whatever civil penalties that she owes, assuming she was found guilty. I also want to say that the press has also been very unfair to her. The newspaper column threw a jab at um, Ma Wanjiao, saying that she spends time shopping. I thought they were so beneath the dignity of the press to make those comments. Ma Wanjiao was forced to stay in a foreign country for more than 1,000 days, fighting a political accusation. She is a pawn for the US-China Cold War. Can we let her preserve her dignity and privacy uh, while suffering boredom, anxiety, health problems, and fighting injustice without being sneered at and, uh, and smudged by the media on gossip news? And I, I just hope that the, the Canadian people understands what this woman is going through right now and that have some conscience uh, on, on that. 
Well, judging by the questions we are receiving, we are indeed very fortunate to have this panel that we have before us today. Um, and I just received a general question directed at the entire panel. It's uh, from Owen Hughes. And his question is, assuming our hopes are realized and the law releases Meng Wanzhou so that she is free to return to Canada, or sorry, free to return to China in October, surely she could have some kind of reparations from the Canadian government. And could it be shown that Canada has, in fact, committed a crime by failing to obey its own laws, which are no extradition for political reasons? Looks like John Philpot wants to take that one. His mic is, um, is muted. John, um, is we have a Zoom situation there with the. Uh... He has to unmute himself. Okay. Now, thank you. Um, well, Owen's question is very relevant. Uh, and I'm not sure that she would want to be get involved in the Canadian legal system, which has been so bad for her up to now. Technically, she could have some kind of uh, lawsuit for abuse of procedure by the Canadian government. Uh, the scope of this is rather complicated uh, to handle. And uh, personally, I think she'd be better off in China and not bother with the Canadian legal system, which has in many ways failed her, as Julie Tang pointed out. And let's just hope that it doesn't fail her in the next month or so. so you, ha you do have a, a recourse, but it's not at all obvious. And if she came to see me as a lawyer, I'm a criminal lawyer, I would say, well, go to me, speak to a civil lawyer, but I would say to them in a very friendly way, don't waste your time. That's my feeling. It's not a legal opinion. I agree with John. I, I think, in fact, she has um, already filed some, some suits. I'm not sure what they were, but I did gloss over them and, and notice that she has initiated that kind of action. Uh, we also had another case in California where um, a Chinese scientist who uh, was accused of uh, economic espionage, and later on he was um, the case was dismissed because there was absolutely no evidence and he was very traumatized being arrested at home with handcuffs and the children and and wife were there and they were also put in handcuffs so that they would not uh, assuming you know when you um, arrest a defendant and they, they want to control the situation it was very traumatic to this professor he lost his job he spent lots of money defending himself only uh, for the DOJ to the uh, Department of Justice to dismiss the case uh, admitting that there was no evidence against him in the first place. Well, he filed numerous lawsuits and he really didn't get anywhere. There's a lot of immunity, um, uh, uh, immunity that law enforcement claim. And it is very hard uh, for anyone who tried to file those suits. But who knows, Mao Wanzhou could be the first to, to push the, the envelope and, um, and whatever she needs to do, she would do. Okay, um, and at this time, we do have a couple more questions directed uh, directly at Julie Tang. Um, and uh, I'll give you two at once because you may be able to address them uh, one by one. Uh, the first is from Anne Santi, and the question is, Judge Tang, do you have any personal experience of anti-Asian uh, discrimination? Uh, and uh, you know, what do panelists think about the media coverage of this case in Canada? and the weaponization of anti-Asian and anti-Chinese hate. I think we'll, we'll bump that panelist aspect down. Uh, first, there's a question to Julie on the issue of personal experience. And the second question to Julie from Michael Wong is, we understand that the United States asserts jurisdiction over Meng Wanzhou based on a SWIFT system. Can Judge Tang tell us how this, this jurisdiction uh, based on the SWIFT system operates? Well, um, let me address the first question first. Um, I, before I 
move on to talk about some of my personal experience. I have to gather here a little bit to try to focus on that. But I, I do want to comment, though, that in the years after the pandemic began in the United States, there was a huge spike in hate crimes against Chinese and Asian Americans. Since then, uh, more than 9,000 anti-Asian hate incidents have been reported to the website Stop AAPI web, um, website. And in spite of the public attention we're getting and efforts made by many well-intentioned people to stop the violence, that doesn't seem any end to it. Uh, currently, there are proposed legislations that local and state um, governments uh, have made to support the Asian community. And President Joe Biden even signed an executive action condemning racism and intolerance against Asian Americans. Uh, these efforts uh, could hardly stand up to the misguided US singular focus on China as an enemy. Our political leaders call China an ex existential threat without really explaining what that meant. The propaganda machine uh, basically uh, spread disinformation about China's domestic situation and exaggerated its threat to the United States. And the object is to malign China and manufacture consent, as Stephen said, to war with China, whether it is Cold War or Kinetic War. Domestically, these kinds of rhetoric and baseless accusations engendered negative sentiments against Chinese Americans by association and Asian Americans mistaken for being uh, uh, for being Chinese, Amer in, for being Chinese, I believe that 82% of Americans hold a negative view of China. 70% 70, 70 of Canadians feel the same. And as long as the U.S. leadership and the media continue to misinform the public about the threat posed by China, hate crimes towards Chinese Americans and Asian Americans will not end anytime soon. Now, the um, the arrest and criminal charges against Ma Wanzhou who is Chinese woman, CFO of Huawei, just adds to the heightened resentment of Americans towards Chinese Americans and Asian Americans, because there is now a face behind the purported China, Chinese threat. Ma Wanzhou represents Huawei, long the target, as Stephen said, target of an all-encompassing sanction scheme to take down Huawei and destroy United States major technological competition. Ma Wanzhou is part of the whole of society threat perceived in the United States. Chinese scientists, academics, they bore the blunt of this whole of society condemnation. Currently, there are hundreds of Chinese American scientists under investigation by the FBI on economic espionage crimes and a handful being pro prosecuted. The fear in the academic community bespeaks Chinese American experience during the last Cold War in the 50s when the Chinese people were arrested and denaturalized because they joined youth groups to learn more about China. In a very uns we are living in a very unsettling time to be Chinese Americans in the United States. And since emigrating to the United States in 1967, I have never felt the degree of danger and risk of harm to myself, my family, as a result of my ethnicity, as I do now. We fear the hate crimes more than the pandemics. With the latter, I feel I have more of a control, vaccine, mass, social distancing. We have no control over hate crimes. I avoid taking public transportation because this is one of the most frequent places where racial incidents happen. But I was not able to escape them even walking on the streets. About a month ago, I was crossing the street against a green light. So I, I had the green light. I was walking across the street and a car coming very quickly on a left turn from across the street, picked up speed as he approached the crosswalk where I was walking and aimed the car at me directly. I had to make a quick jump back in order to avoid being hit. At first I thought it was just another bad driver, but as the car passed me, he gave me a finger with a very menacing look. <laughs> I knew what he meant. It is so painful to talk about these incidents. I'm sorry, it is just really painful. Asian Americans will never be safe in this country unless the United States stop considering China as an enemy. Well, that is certainly a lot to consider, not just in terms of the detail of what was said, but the personal perspective. And I'm afraid there must be many, many, many such similar accounts across the United States and Canada of people who have experienced heightened discrimination. And I had been asked 
um, also, and we, we have received another question for a couple panelists, but I had been asked about this specific issue um, with regard to the rest of the panel as well, given its seriousness. So um, um, in terms of the panelists, um, Stephen and John, did you have any thoughts on the media coverage of the Meng Wanzhou case, the Huawei uh, issue generally, and the related weaponization of anti-Asian and anti-Chinese hatred? Stephen, or? You're asking me to go? Um, weaponization, I'm not sure it's a deliberate weaponization, but it's a consequence of this geostrategic strategy um, which seeks to demonize China. And we've seen this with the demonization of um, Arab speaking, or, or rather demonization, for example, of, uh, of Arab nationalist governments, um, which the consequence of that was um, a racism against Arabs, certainly in Canada, and I believe in the United States too. I mean, there's rather vile racism against those people. And this is an inevitable consequence of programs to manufacture consent for aggression against a target country. Uh, people start to think that the, the nationals of that country become a fair target that you can say whatever you want about those people. You can demonize them, you can revile them, and it's all politically acceptable. And while that happens, politicians um, decry it, and it's all insincere because it's the actions of politicians and their words um, that um, is ultimately responsible for, the, for unleashing this kind of racism that we see. Um, so if the United States decides to escalate its uh, campaign against Russia, then we will also see uh, you know, this anti-Slavic racism. In fact, in my personal life, um, I have encountered many people who have said some very vile and offensive things about Russians because they think they, they can get away with that, said vile and offensive things about Slavs, vile and offensive things about Chinese, uh, and vile and offensive things about Arabs. And it just so happens that those are the groups that our governments, led by the United States, um, happen to be demonizing. So this is an inevitable consequence of this kind of imperialist strategy of dominating countries which are called revisionist powers and which are challenging the international dictatorship of the United States. I'd like to say something about this. Um, there's a long history of Anglo-Saxon dominance where they accuse everybody of being inferior and everybody of being racist and everybody of being backward. This is something which runs right through Canadian history and before, but from Johnny and MacDonald on, and we, we're confronting that now. We even saw this in the... Uh, election when they accused people, us from Quebec, for being racist when we're not, but we're not very racist. On the contrary, we're less racist. And I think it was in the French debate, uh, I don't know who here saw it, I'm pretty sure it wasn't in the English debate, where Mr. Um, Justin Trudeau was questioned about uh, the two Michaels and Meng Wanzhou, and they, it was a good question. And he said, he just went back on the two Michaels and said, we cannot release her we cannot have people being uh, arbitrarily arrested. We have to stand firm and not allow uh, foreign countries to arrest China, to arrest arbitrarily our citizens. And so the treatment of the two Michaels has polluted all the political parties without exception. And the political parties, all the political parties, including uh, have been terrible on the question of China, supporting the, the campaign against the Winter Olympics, promoting the lies about uh, genocide in, 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 in the Muslim area of China. And our politicians bear a lot of responsibility, even more maybe than the media. I'm, I'm not going to balance that. It's hard to, get to, to, to make a... But 
our politicians have to look at foreign policy and not simply a few small local things. And uh, I'm very, very ashamed of the Canadian uh, politicians right now. Uh, there's been some backtracking at times, but uh, we have a big, big problem with Canadian politicians who are responsible for this hatred, which is, uh, Stephen has described, against, against uh, people of Asiatic origin and other area, other uh, groups. Yes, well, that is some big picture thinking, the kind that I think people expect from the panel. And uh, so thank you for that. Um, at the same time, I keep getting a lot of very specific questions about the trial, uh, the case of Meng Wanzhou itself. Uh, in this case, there's been one waiting for a bit. It's uh, from Peter Eglin. And he asked, uh, he said, this is for John and perhaps Stephen. Do we have any reason to believe that the judge herself in this case or any Canadian judge would be subject to political influence? Uh, have there been any such cases? Well, we all know the judges are favored by political parties. And in the, at the federal level, judges are very much nominated because of their political persuasions. It's not an absolute question. I know I have friends who are judges who are very respectable. I have friends who are picist in, in the Superior Court in Quebec, people I know who I respect. But um, their judges read newspapers. Judges know uh, who named them, and they're very sensitive to the winds that are blowing in the world. It's hard to go any farther than that. I think the answer to this is the campaign, which is being led by this group and elsewhere, is probably the best way to try and make the judges make a fair ruling. And I, I can't really say more than that. Obviously, we, we mistrust judges. Judges cannot be trusted. In a, and people said many times that all these campaigns, uh, if we don't have a, a strong campaign, the law which you explain to a judge uh, has no value. I worked as a defense counsel at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, and I'm prepared to say that, and there are some exceptions, but the judges accepted the general discourse, the big lies, and people were presumed guilty. And when they brought 50 witnesses, then they could might get off. And I've been involved in trial, a, a trial in the US, and innocent men are found guilty all the time in the US. And if you think that Meng Wanzhou is going to have a fair trial in the US, federal prosecutions, they always win. Now, there's some exceptions, but the, the federal prosecutor, and Julie will, knows that, the federal prosecutor wins his cases. He knows how to set them up. He knows how to influence the juries. He knows how to be demagogic, and they are demagogic. Sometimes juries are worse than judge alone trials, for those of you who Everybody thinks juries are wonderful. Maybe sometimes. So I wouldn't. And if Alex Sav ever got transferred to the US, you can't expect him to have a fair trial. The US is not a fair country. Canada is not so fair either, but I'm not going to, you know, throw them all in the same baskets. This is my thinking. And uh, I know my, I can see some American friends on this present here. I think they would probably agree with me. And these are interesting things to discuss because we can't trust our legal system, but we want to. And we have to fight for it to be fair. Okay, well, on a related note, we have some a couple of snappy questions, or one in particular that seems to be directed towards the Canadian panelists. Uh, it's from Dean Baxendale, and he says, since Hmong is innocent, why fight extradition in Canada? Just go to New York and present her case. Furthermore, the conditions Sister Mung is under are that of luxury, and the BS statement that the two Michaels were spies is ludicrous. Uh, so does, does anyone want to respond to those questions? Well, I can answer that. In fact, I answered the first one already just now, is that when person is charged in a federal court, they're called district courts in the US, 
the success rate, I don't have the figures, but it's something like 95%. They win their trials because they know how to do their job. They know how to influence the judges and the juries. And that's what everybody plea bargains in the States. You plea bargain and get and lower the charges. Mung cannot plea bargain, I don't think. All right. Now, about her being in luxury, well, she's a, I think she's well off. But is it a crime to be well off? She's a dignified person working for a dignified company, which is advancing technology for the entire world, which is good for the entire world. And she should not be treated. And she's, she has to pay for the guards. So I, I, you know, the question is, I guess it's relevant, but you're not going to get a fair trial, fair trial in the States, I don't think. I just also want to say that the question itself is very self-defeating. When you are innocent, you don't just come in and give up. You fight every step of the way. And this is how we should do it uh, in our personal lives and in our society, in our community, and especially where the issues are beyond her. It is so critical right now. It is critical because it involves world peace. We talk about a war. We talk about nuclear issues. We're talking about in the South Sea, the danger that exists there is something you can't imagine that at any moment now, there could be something that sparked a, world, a war that, is, that would be calamitous. We, just, we know recently that the United States is now stockpiling nuclear powered um, submarines in Australia, but the next step would be probably Japan and then South Korea, I, 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 but I don't think South Korea is buying in and then Taiwan. Uh, what kind of world are we talking about? So we're not talking about uh, this chicken, you know, games of chicken, where if, if I'm, I'm gonna win, then I'm just gonna lie flat and then I'll, I'll take care of business. No, you fight. And if you were in the same position, sir, the one who asked the question, you would do the same too. You will not let these things happen to you because it's more than Mang Wan Zhao. It's about a whole country's dignity. It's about a whole country's safety and a whole country's future. And I'm talking about the country, not just China, but America, because we are involved in it also. And what we're doing is wrong and we should correct those wrong. And if it means that Mang Wan Zhao will be the one who tell us we're wrong, then let her do it. I'd also <clears throat> like to uh, address the question because the question is obviously a hostile one, and, but one that comes from the, the view that is almost the regnant or dominant view in Canada that the two Michaels um, were arrested in retaliation, that the charge of espionage against them is bogus. I think that was mentioned in the question. Um, and they are living uh, in very austere circumstances, imprisoned in austere circumstances while Ming is living in luxury. I think that's the nature of the question. And it's a question that should be addressed because this is the view uh, of the Canadian media. It's the view of Canadian governments and it's the view that's accepted widely within Canada. Um, but I mean, I might have a slightly different view about the two Michaels and the other panelists. Uh, I mean, the questioner said this is a BS charge, which is interesting. Um, I'm not sure how you know that it's a BS charge. There are lots of people that seem to have considerable certitude about these things. They simply know somehow magically that it's a BS charge. I don't know if it's a BS charge. It might be, it might not be. Uh, but I think, um, that there are a lot of people who assume they know far more than they actually do. Um, we must also accept the fact that Canadians do engage in espionage and Canada does engage in espionage. And we'd be naive to think that Canadians are not engaged in espionage in China. Um, so the whole idea that this is a BS charge is rather naive. Uh, although I'll acknowledge it could be a BS charge. We don't know. Uh, but the whole idea that this can be dismissed out of hand is completely indefensible, uh, unless we want to um, you know, be deliberately naive. 
the, the question about luxury and living in luxury and why doesn't she go to New York to face the charges that she's innocent? Well, that's irrelevant. What we're talking about is the issue of political kidnapping. We're talking about this within a larger political con context. And we shouldn't be um, deliberately blind and deliberately uh, ignorant of the fact, which is before our very eyes, that the United States and Canada and US allies are engaged in a war against China. It might not be a kinetic war at this point, but it's certainly engaged in a war against China, in a war against Huawei, in a war against China's challenge to economic supremacy. Um, and so we shouldn't be divorcing the Meng Wanzhou question from this larger context, which is what the question does. The question starts focusing on certain charges that the Canadian government makes to defend itself from the fact that it's engaged in a political kidnapping, from the fact that it's engaged in an illegitimate act. So, I mean, these are all red herrings about luxury, Meng Wanzhou living in luxury, and BS charge against the two Michaels. As I said, we don't know if it's a BS charge. Um, and there, in my view, is far too many people who claim to know far more than they could possibly know about what Meng Wanzhou did, about what the two Michaels did. And so I think we ought to be reasonable and we ought to recognize that there are some things that aren't known, that there are some things that we can't know uh, but to look at this within a larger political context and to look at how it is that Canada has engaged in activity that is politically indefensible. We, we can always count on Stephen to put things in context. Uh, good discussion, panelists. Uh, we do have some good and interesting questions. Uh, some of them are to the whole panel. Uh, this one is from Janelle Felina, and it is comments on the recently re-elected liberal minority government and any impacts that might have on Meng Wanzhou's case, such as any new developments or changes. So how the re-election of Trudeau and the minority government might have any impacts on the case, and that's to the entire panel. The only thing I can say about this is, I'm sure glad they got a, didn't get a majority because now they have to deal with other parties and we have more, a better chance maybe of working with other parties and putting influence on these types of issues through other parties. Um, Trudeau lost his gamble and he is not as strong as he was, may have been a year ago. but. That's, oh, I can't say much more than that. And yet, ironically, some of the major opposition to the detention of Meng comes from within the Liberal Party. Yeah, sure. Or, or at least those who were associated with the Kretschian yeah. wing of the party. For sure. From an American perspective, I don't even think it matters. I mean, it's America that calls the shots, right? So it really doesn't matter. Um, I, I think that um, the Canadian government um, probably doesn't hate China as much as they are afraid of the United States. So whatever they're doing right now, I, I don't think they can move very much unless um, there is a signal from the United States. The only person who can do anything is really the judge. The judge has, could exert a judicial independence and uh, do what is right for man and follow the law. And if she does that, then, um, then everybody would just blame her. And then she would say, I'm exercising my judicial independence based on the law as I see it. So she really is the only one who can do it. I, I don't have a lot of hope that, that she would based on the decisions that she has made up to this point. And I have even less hope that the foreign minister would do anything unless America stri strikes a deal um, with Ma Wanjiao. 
I heard that they're working on something right now, but who knows, you know? Um, so <laughs> that's my little two cents on the on your election. I don't know much about what happened, who the figures are, who, who the players are, but it just seems like it really doesn't matter. <laughs> I, I would agree that the United States has enormous influence over Canadian policy, but it doesn't have total influence over Canadian policy. And but I'm the, glad to hear that. Mm -hmm. and, and the wing of the Liberal Party to which I alluded uh, or referred directly earlier was a wing that was trying to embolden the current government and saying, we have at times in the past defied the US government. We defied mm -hmm. the US government on Iraq, for example. Canada didn't participate as vigorously as other countries did. Um, and so they tried to, to importune the current government to get some backbone because this was not a decision that was good. That is the decision to uh, detain Meng was not a decision that was good for Canadian foreign policy, is not a good decision that was good for Canada. So it's not the case that, that we always do what the United States tells us to do. And I also think it's the case that, I mean, it's not only the judge that can do something, also the uh, Minister of Justice is in the position um, to uh, put an end to the detention as mm -hmm. well. Certainly on, on the issue of United States influence, I do recall that the people following the Meng Wanzhou case placed a lot of emphasis on what would happen during the recent or the previous United States election, of course. The question was, if Trump is out and Biden is in, how does that affect the case? That was one of the biggest things we in Canada were waiting for, of course, the results of the United States presidential election on the Meng Wanzhou case. Uh, now, uh, as far as the Liberal Party goes, it's been commented that the Jean Chrétien era uh, appeared to be one of the last times you would have seen some kind of inkling of an independent Canadian foreign policy, such as on what Stephen mentioned, the case of the Iraq war, where uh, Jean Chrétien did manage to reduce Canada's participation in that. So um, it's interesting to discuss that wing of the Liberal Party being active uh, in, in this particular case. There was a, an immediate question that followed up on what Ju Julie was saying about um, morale, essentially, about how do we feel this case is going to go. Um, so there's a question from KJ No to everyone, and it's, uh, Canada has a long history of kidnapping and renditioning innocents like Mahar Arar. Also, it has a history of fighting tooth and nail to prevent the extradition of certified criminals. Given this history, what gives you any optimism that they will render justice in this situation? <laughs> well, uh, many of us are optimists given the strength of the movement and we're in a different context now than 20 years ago and we have organizations like this organization and others who are fighting on sanctions issues, on war issues. The anti-war movement is a bit stronger than it was 10 years ago, not, it was 20 years ago when the anti-war movement was stronger than now. But so I'm optimistic uh, that we're gonna win these, this case and uh, the related case of Alex Saab and I think the US is a declining power. This may be a factor in the US decline may allow Canon to embolden itself and act independently. But it's not for me to second guess. I don't know that. Of course we don't know. And uh, everyone here in the in the audience uh, is as wise as we are on this. Yeah, it looks as if the panelists have may have more to say on this issue. And, uh, and Jonathan Dye had asked a related question to this uh, in terms of the post-election situation and where we are now. Uh, Jonathan Dye asked, you know, given what we've been talking about, 
where might you see this whole case going with Hmong and all the related aspects uh, now at present time following the election of Trudeau? Uh, what do you think is a likely direction forward? I can only answer the question, why should we expect that there be any change? We don't have a change in government. We've had an election, which is a, <laughs> turned out to be a completely inutile exercise in which nothing has changed. The government remains the same, the same players still operating within the same context. Personally, I foresee no change. It's like in America, when Biden was elected, we were hoping that there will be a softening of the confrontation, but it hasn't softened. It's just taken on a different look. You know, it's just have a gentler, superficial, hypocritical um, presence, but all the fightings and, and are still, still going on. And the, the military industrial complex is still in control. We still have billionaires in control. We have a lot of stakeholders that are in control. And those people, those, those people are not going to let go. And also Biden hired a whole group of um, people in his cabinet, advisors, who actually are just dressed differently, have different names. They know different from Bolden and Pompeo, um, uh, uh, people who are hawkish to the right in the Republican Party. They all espouse the same thing right now. They all wanted to get rid of China. They all wanted to push that China back to where it was, impoverished China, and uh, so that they can, so that we are the only game in town. So that Iran and Venezuela and 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 all those countries that are now uh, suffering under sanctions will not have somebody or a country that give them food and, and trade with them and, and support them so that we are the only empire here. So um, it, it really is it's beyond these people that you see in politics. They, are, they look like they're calling the shots. It's not, <laughs> it's the same people dressed in a different cloak and different hat and look a little differently, maybe have a little different, different <laughs> makeup on. <laughs> Is, is still the same old, same old. I mean, we're just so disappointed in, in, in Biden, people said, but why should we? It's, it's the same, same baggage there. Well, aside from general prognostications about the case, uh, there is a specific question that was posed by Miguel Figueroa. And he, uh, he said, there's been renewed reports recently in the New York Times or similar of quiet negotiations resuming about a possible deal between the U.S., the United States authorities and Miss Mung and her legal team. So do we have any further information at all about this and the likelihood that a deal could be cut leading to her release and repatriation? Um, well, I, I can, the, the sentence that was in the paper also had something about her pleading guilty and going back to China. And uh, I would doubt very much if she would plead guilty. Julie talked about the century of humiliation and the fact that China is strong. And I would be astonished that they would actually accept there's any wrongdoing by Huawei and by Meng Wanzhou. The, the, the optimism which I, and, but they can negotiate and there's are, there, there are smart ways of negotiating and I've seen this in, when someone's losing, they find a way to negotiate sometimes. That's sort of a lawyer's instinct. But you don't want to end with a guilty plea. That's Charlie Roach was very good. Many of you don't know Charlie Roach, wonderful Toronto lawyer who didn't like people to didn't want to plead guilty. We saw the Americans being showed up in Alaska. What was it in March? They they were very weak before in on the all the and they had this wonderful. Chinese interpreter, a, a young woman interpreter who was so eloquent, and the Americans looked like fools. And so, but um, 
I can't say much more and really answer whether we know anything about this. And when negotiations are going on, no one really lets the, the real negotiations, what's, what's being discussed never gets out. What puzzled me about the report that was in the Globe and Mail about the discussions of a potential deal was that there had been earlier a report about discussions about a potential deal. Same deal, which is you admit your guilt, you pay a fine, and we'll release you. But at that point, the founder of uh, Huawei, Meng's father, said, why would we do that? We're not going to do that. We haven't done anything wrong. So my understanding was that proposal had already been put to them and has already been dismissed. So it's kind of puzzling as to why it would be broached again. Yeah. The negotiation is um, another form of blackmailing. It really is. It's, it's, always, uh, it, it's the overcharge, and I'm sure John will know this better, better than anybody else here. The overcharge and then whittle it down to very little. Uh, basically, uh, whatever that they could get out of it and the prosecution, all they want is that conviction. They just want that conviction. And it's also blinksmanship. Uh, you, uh, I, I see defendants who are really innocent uh, when they push it to the limit, the case will be dismissed because they, the district attorney don't want to expend those resources uh, to, and they want to have a good record. Like John was saying, 90% of convictions, they want to keep those things to get the fundings and stuff like that. So uh, we don't know, really know, we don't really know what's happening because plea negotiations by nature are very confidential. They leak some news out. And, um, but I think the best negotiation is to release, release Meng Wanzhou <laughs> and, 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 with, and, and Meng Wanzhou can say, okay, release me, but, and I will, I will allow you not to say, make an apology. Otherwise, release her with an apology. <laughs> well, John Philpot, you talked about optimism and the reasons you have optimism. Um, and someone was maybe thinking along the same lines, uh, Suzanne Weiss asked uh, everyone, uh, what is the next step that supporters of Meng Wanzhou should take? Well, I'll, I'll kick this off. Uh, I mean, I think that's a good question. And raising the issue of optimism is also appropriate. I mean, we were talking about predictions and trying to anticipate what the Canadian government is going to do and the constraints under which it operates. Um, but we shouldn't think about what Canadian governments do or any government does as somehow beyond our influence. I mean, the whole point of exercises like this is not only to be optimistic, but I mean, the only thing that's going to change the direction of the Canadian government is the pressure that we bring to bear on the Canadian government. And the only thing that's gonna change the direction of the US government is the pressure that Americans bring to bear on their government. So what is it we can do? I mean, no, I don't get into specifics, but I mean, most generally, we have to bring pressure to bear um, on our government, especially in Canada, where the Minister of Justice has the authority to end Meng's detention. Okay, very good. Um, I just wanted to make sure one of the specific questions that was asked for Julie uh, was answered in full. I haven't been able to verify that. Uh, there was a question from Michael Wong about uh, the SWIFT system. Um, and he, uh, he, he, he said, we, we know that the U.S. asserts jurisdiction over Hmong based on the SWIFT system. Um, and we were just wondering if you could tell us how that works. Did, did we get to answer that in full or was there? No, I'm, I'm so glad you reminded me. And um, I'm not an expert in financial matters, but I belong to a group and they, we exchange emails and, and we, we educate each other. So my answer comes from a, you know, a, a basic combination of what I've learned from uh, the people in my group. Uh, the US dollar, we know, is the world's leading reserve currency. And a majority of the financial institutions in the world utilize a financial system called the SWIFT, which is controlled by the United States to conduct money transfers. 
So if you buy something in Hong Kong um, from a department store, and that department store uh, is belong is a subsidiary of America, so uh, that money will be um, delivered to America and register there, and then come back, you know, to prove that that was digital payments. Now the U.S. asserts that it has jurisdiction over all persons who use the SWIFT money transfer system and assume that it has jurisdiction over Mang. Uh, when Huawei and HSBC's money, transa money transaction happened in Hong Kong, passed through the US banking system for a millimeter of a split second, that's when um, America said that now we have you, your, your jurisdiction over your person. So it is really a legal fiction, but it's maintained by the United States, giving an immense power to allow the United States to apply its own laws to foreign parties doing business outside of the United States. The US also uses long arm practice to claim jurisdiction to arrest foreigners and bring them into the United States to stand trial in the United States on the theory that one voluntarily submits to the jurisdiction of the United States by using the SWIFT system. Even if they did not personally did it or even know about it, but somehow the money that they paid in or the transaction that they involved with utilized the SWIFT system. Now, this practice is now being called into question, and, and perhaps the Meng Wanzhou case will serve as a landmark case where people and foreign countries will start paying attention to the exploitation of the SWIFT system that impinges on the freedom and liberty of people who had nothing to do with the United States. And they are, and they are not free from the arrest and seizure by the US government and can be charged with wire fraud for a crime that the United States considers as a crime and their country does not. So um, I don't know if it has already happened or not, but eventually I think this issue will be heard in the US Supreme Court to determine its legality. But right now the, the world you know, is not safe from United States long arm jurisdiction, arrest seizure, if they buy into this SWIFT system or if any of their purchases, transactions go through the SWIFT system. I hope I answered that question. <laughs> oh yes, I certainly think so. Um, and uh, in terms of the broader issues uh, that the panel has been alluding to, kidnapping and such, uh, there is a question from Roger Harris to the panel, and that is another political kidnapping is that of Venezuelan diplomat, Alex Saab, who the United States is trying to extradite uh, from Cabo Verde. Please compare his case with that of Hmong. Well, I can talk about it because I'm on both committees. I'm on the, and I know Roger, and Roger's done a terrific job because he went to Cabo Verde in June and did, he, with other people, did a tremendous, made a tremendous campaign and visit to Cabo Verde, and they worked very hard in the U.S. on this. And there's a demonstration today in New York in favor of Roger, of, of um, Alex Saab. The issues legally are are not all the, not the same, because he has an indictment for. He's accused. He's a very senior and incompetent uh, businessman from Venezuela who's loyal to the Venezuelan government. And he helped build uh, low-income housing, which is one of the great successes of the Maduro uh, and Chavez administrations. And he did it very expeditiously, very carefully. And the US in Florida has accused him of money laundering in, that transa in those um, transactions uh, in it's a, it's a long arm again, but under a different law about corrupting foreign officials. And uh, so it's now um, Miss, Mr. Alex Saab was cleared because this banking went through some Swiss banks and they checked out the money, money laundering and cleared them completely of any money laundering because I guess Swiss, Swiss, Swiss banks don't like their banks to be used in this way or something like that anyway, but he was cleared. Now, um, what they've done is he was traveling on a private jet, as Roger knows, and this audience should know about it. And he was he, he got off the jet in refueling. He was supposed to refuel in Morocco and he couldn't. So they went to Cape Verde. It's a very small country. And um, he was arrested. And then the next day they brought a red alert from 
on his name, but it was the wrong name. And he was held uh, in communicado in, with no light. He almost went blind. He didn't have proper medical care. Eventually, a regional court, uh, the regional court for West Africa, uh, got him released and he got into house arrest, which is really house arrest, but he's still arrested. And uh, the, the court in the West Africans called Eco West Court um, ordered him released and ordered Cape Verde to pay him um, $200,000. Uh, the UN was dealt with it, the UN Human Rights Committee. Uh, he made a complaint for risk of being sent to the US and they uh, requested Cape Verde to stop the proceedings and they made it, they made this order on the 8th of June. Um, and then two weeks ago, the Cape Verde Supreme the Constitutional Court said in a judgment of 194 pages, which is in my computer right in front of me, said that the, his extradition was legal. His lawyers are very, still very optimistic and um, the government of Venezuela has, has really become very supportive of him and have, has named him to be as a diplomat. Oh, he's a diplomat. I forgot all the most, one of the most important factors. He was a plenipotentiary diplomat going to Iran to negotiate supplies of fuel and food for Venezuela, which is under sanctions. And we cannot, the sanctions that Venezuela, I'm sure most of you know about it, are strangling the country and starving the country and depriving of medicine. So he was, he's being extradited for trying to save people from terrible suffering by US sanctions. That's the overlap, because it overlaps with the Iranian sanctions. Now, um, so the Venezuelan government last two weeks, a week and a half ago, named him to be on their negotiating te team for the negotiations with the opposition in Mexico. And so, uh, again, here we go with optimism again, uh, Stephen, but there's a kind of optimism um, in the people fighting for um, Alex Saab, and it's very measured, and we all thought he was gone in, in June, and uh, I can see people present here on the committee, and he still, he was transferred to the main island, and he's getting medical care, I understand. I haven't got the confirmation, but it would appear to be true. So there's. Um, the issue of seizing foreign dignitaries for extradition for obvious political purposes is what's in common. And what we, many of us, and I think it's probably one of the preoccupations of many people here is who is next also. We want both of these people to be released immediately and we want to stop this process. And a lot of it comes down to the question of sanctions. Universe, universe, unilateral coerce, co, um, coercive measures and sanctions kill has just published a report on this issue, which we're distributing to the UN, to the US Congress, internationally we're distributing it. And I think what's important to know at the end of a conflict, the government which loses has to pay sanctions. And we know that 70% of the world is opposed to sanctions in the UN. And it's blacked out in our newspapers. We're, in the, like, we're like in the US, it's blacked out. And so uh, the issue of sanctions is eventually the US is going to have to pay reparations. I'm convinced of that. And when they starve people and make them suffer, it's a crime against humanity. And it may not, it may be the ICC, it may be some other court which is named after the next conflict. So the US has an interest right now in stopping this right away. And these are issues which are going to um, bind us together in these struggles in the, in the coming years. I know that in Canada, from the point of view of Canada, I think we have to stop, force Canada, like Stephen says, to let her out now, the Minister of Justice, Article 23 of the ex Section 23 of the Extradition Act, allows him to do it, and we have to stop it right now. And there's a site, Free Alex Sab, a lot of material available, and 
the people watching these things or watching this program to this meeting today are all intelligent. Inform yourself about this because this is one of the one of the areas of conflict, which is is going to hit us all in the next five years. I think. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, John. That was very thorough and relates to the case. Um, there's only one final question uh, outstanding that uh, we wanted to look at. Uh, it's almost time to wrap up. Uh, but in terms of the general theme of optimism and action and so forth, there is a question from Ben Lefebvre. Uh, he said, what can we do? Write letters to the editor decrying the hypocrisy of the Canadian government? It would not be difficult as our country's hypocrisy is rather widespread rule of law, the Lima group following US foreign policy for starters. So it's a question about what action should be taken at this point as we close out the meeting. What do you think are things people can participate in and do in order to help the case of Meng Wanzhou and also to challenge sanctions and these uh, behaviors by the United States that you've been highlighting? Well, I, I think that's an excellent question. I think everything little, every little thing helps. Recently, I read an article by Caitlin Johnston. I think uh, some of you may know her. She does a blog. She always writes very inspiringly. And, and people like KJ know they, they all inspire me. Uh, KJ, uh, they both talked about um, in their articles that they write that whatever little th thing we do would help. And never um, try to think that you have to do the best. Um, you just do whatever you can do based on your own estimate uh, that you, you that would be helpful. I think letters to editor is very helpful. And don't worry that if they are not published, because the editors do read them. They read those letters. And our group constantly write letters to editors. And once in a while, they get published. And, um, and a lot of times, they don't. But the main thing is that if you want to change editorial opinion, you do have to write to the newspapers. One of the failures, I think, um, in, in all, all the things that we do is not so much our failure, but the propaganda machine from mainstream media is so powerful. It just sweeps up everything. And, and is so, I mean, New York Times has millions of readers, Washington Post, you know, and here we're struggling with small little firms for donations, you know, to... And then we're proud that we have seven, several thousand readerships, but we have to do whatever we can do. And, and, and like the, the, the old man that moved the mountain, a little step at a time. But if we don't do it, that's when we really fail. So um, I appreciate the person who asked the questions. I often self-doubt myself and say, oh, what can I add to the movement? So um, I, people ask me to speak, then I will speak. And sometimes I think I did a horrible job, but I still spoke. And sometimes we would say, hey, I, I heard what you said was great. And if people go away with just one idea that I shared, or one idea that John shared, or one idea that Stephen shared, or one idea that Brandon, you shared, I think we've succeeded you know, in what we do. <laughs> I think there's um, something about, um, I don't want to be too categorical, but there's, Groups like Canada Files, which I can't see, it, which is publishing. We have the gray zone in the US, which is, we have to continually educate ourselves and move beyond the paradigm of 20 or 30 years ago. Some of us are getting older. Some people still are thinking like 20 or 30 years ago. And we have a lot of politicians who pretend to be progressive, but support the war on Venezuela um, it's shocking. Uh, they support the war, the war, the ideological and economic war on China. And we have a politician like AOC. Didn't she vote for, vote for sanctions against Venezuela? Um, so these are things which we have to really work on the so-called left. Maybe they'll change. Maybe they're, they won't change. But um, the debate in politics um, has to be carried forward. And, and among our political representatives, um, like the Green Party leader was shameful in the last six months, shameful in the, in the last election. Um, I won't go into all the details because it's not the issue right now before us, but 
uh, you know, there's been some success in the NDP with respect to Palestine, I think, and I'm not involved in the NDP, so, but there was a little bit of a movement on, on something. So these are all things which are very important to, 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 to do and to work on. And um, that's where we're at now, I guess. And I'd just like to add, I mean, obviously there's no magic bullet and uh, any kind of political change requires enormous effort and often little success. But that's one something one ought to recognize at first that there's no um, obvious solution. It's not gonna happen overnight, uh, but it does require some optimism. Uh, but there's a nice model of what we can do and how we can organize and how we can pressure. And the model is actually the Hamilton Coalition to stop the war. I've been watching what they've been doing on this Meng file, and it's, uh, it's rather admirable. And uh, it deserves a lot of credit. They've done some great work, not only in terms of Ken Stone, for example, writing and others, writing great uh, editorials and getting them published in mainline newspapers, in building coalitions. We saw the large group of sponsors here. Uh, and also politics. I mean, oftentimes people who get involved in these issues complain, you know, there's no political party around here that represents my view. Often there are political parties that represent your view. And in the last election or the, the election we've had, uh, on Monday, I mean, the Hamilton coalition to stop the war was pointing to political parties in Canada and political candidates who had uh, a point of view on Ming that they agreed with and that we on this, this call or this event would agree with. Um, so I think that's important. Uh, but again, I, I want to call out uh, not only the Hamilton Coalition to stop the war, but there are other groups too. There was the, the Communist Party of Canada has also been active in trying to build pressure to free Meng. And sometimes there are political parties that are active politically that we don't recognize or we don't want to recognize, but perhaps we should be engaged with. Okay, well, that's a good way to end things off with us, uh, especially pointing to the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War and the other organizations involved in this. Uh, I was supposed to list them all at the end, in fact, but we don't. Uh, Stephen has uh, made a lot of our points for us. Uh, so don't forget to go to the poster and look again at the sponsoring organizations, because uh, it's not just here in Canada, of course, but other organizations as well in the United States, the United Kingdom in particular. Um, there's been talk about an international panel activity at an international level for the Meng Wanzhou campaign. So we're grateful to all the organizations involved because they may be able to do different types of activity as well. In Canada, please do write letters to the editor. We provided a template during one of the social media days, for example. There's all sorts of things you can do to intervene politically in your own space, in your own city, in your own town, in your own newspaper, and so forth. And that's very important um, before, during, and after elections. Um, and so, uh, yes, uh, if you want to get donations and, and such, you can go to hcsw.ca and check the donate button. You can contact us to get on our email list, for example. You can visit the poster and see all the sponsoring organizations. I want to thank, uh, in particular, Alison Bodine from uh, the Mobilization Against War and Occupation. She's been running technical uh, during this event to keep it all running consistently, uh, even after a hardware issue. Uh, so, uh, Allison, thanks very much for keeping that all going and, and for doing the technical work and for Mawo's participation and for all the organizations. Um, the international panel that we're looking at doing is perhaps going to be around October 20th or 21st. Keep an eye on that. There's also planned activity regarding Venezuela uh, sometime earlier in October. So you may hear about that from us on our email list. Get on that list. And uh, December 1st is going to be the third year of Hmong's 
unjust detention, uh, just to remind you. So those who want to get more involved in this broader campaign, the Cross Canada campaign to free Meng Wanzhou, you can write to us at hcsw at kojiko.ca or just go to the website, go to the contact section. So uh, thanks everyone and, and thanks for being on time and keeping it timely and, and on schedule and everything like that too. We appreciate that. So uh, we'll close out and we'll let our hosts and co-hosts close the discussion. Thanks again for coming. Thanks for the live stream and we'll try to get a video up in a few days. Thank you.